is going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on Off The Script. This is your AEW Dynamite review for Wednesday, June 24th, 2020. Little bit of a different look tonight, as I got my buddy Jesse with me as always. Now he's not on the screen, just sometimes he's on the screen all the time. Jesse, what's up, man? Oh, Jesse, all the time. What's going on, man? Hey, you know what? Guess what? Your buddy Salrex follow me on Twitter. I don't want you to get jealous, but me and Salrex are kind of like this, man. Oh, yeah, really? He, uh, you didn't block him? Nope. No, no. I apparently, apparently back, uh, everybody that gets triggered by his comments just ends up blocking him. Sounds like me. Oh, well, there you go. See, yeah, it makes sense now. There you go. He made the beautiful layout tonight. And now we are definitely working with Dynamite here on Off The Script, man. So thank you guys so much for joining me here on the podcast. We got a big night, man. We got Fighter Fest coming up in one week. It's a two-week event. And I don't know if you heard it tonight, but I believe Tony Schiavone says it's too big for just one night. Where, where did we hear that as of recently? First time I ever heard that. Oh, man. Remember the WrestleMania that was uh, too much garbage for one night? Yeah. Yeah. Nah, I'd rather I've forget that. that. I'm still waiting for a greatest match of all time. We should get one of those. Greatest matches of all time in AEW? No, I just met a greatest match of all time. Oh, well, I mean... When was the Pac Omega match? That was this year, right? That Iron Man match? That was earlier this year, right? You gotta forgive me, man. Between COVID and everything else and everything else, I don't remember what happened in what year anymore. Well, it, 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 either way, either way. If that was if that was this year, I put that match up against Edge and Randy Orton. I got dude, I could go through a ton of matches that was better than that match. I'm not saying it was a bad match. The it was it wasn't was, a bad match. No, the match was good. The match was great. But I mean, I don't even put it anywhere in like probably anywhere in the top five of matches this year. I mean, not making it a bad really? match. Really? I'm yeah. surprised I'm surprised by that comment. You're not gonna put it in your top ten matches of twenty twenty at the end of the year? Man, I mean I haven't done it yet, but challenge me to and I will go back and legitimately find at least five matches better than that one. I mean, I'm sure, I just, I'm sure the listening audience will as well. Yes, absolutely, man. I'll well, post it on Twitter. You posted it on Twitter? I will post it on Twitter. Oh. I oh. will post it on Twitter. I'll find five matches better oh. than that one. Well, well, there you go. His Twitter, his Twitter handle is right underneath his camera name there. Look, see? Go follow him and then go. Uh, oh, you can't see. It. You'll see it afterwards. But uh, Salrex did the job tonight, though. So don't worry about it. Anyway, we're not here to talk about fucking Edge and Randy Orton and the lamest match of all time. We're here to talk about Fighter Fest. We got a lot going on for Fighter Fest. Now, again, we said it last week. Jericho and Orange Cassidy, the Blood Oranges, the Inner Circle, and the Best Friends. It's a match that I really didn't anticipate at all at the birth of AEW. And here we are going into Fighter Fest into the summer of 2020, and it's probably the most anticipated match for myself going into Fighter Fest. How do you feel about that? What are you, what are you thinking about this Orange Cassidy Chris Jericho feud. I'm looking at Orange Cassidy, man, at the end of tonight's show, and I I, I don't want to say it outwardly just reminded me of it. It's like a fucking picture-in-picture picture screen with both of them, but the way Orange Cassidy stood on the table at the end of Dynamite kind of reminded me of Becky Lynch when she had her Survivor Series moment with Nia Jax. That was... And we didn't talk about that beforehand, but yeah, that was definitely, absolutely his Becky Lynch moment. Um, Jericho was amazing, man. You know, everything he he did for guys like Pineapple Pete, where he Who? can... I mean, heck, the, man, don't... <laughs> no. I get it. I'm sorry to cut you off. Get it. Talk to the people. Get it. Pineapple Pete is fucking awesome. All right, look. All right, good. But what he did for Pineapple Pete, it was pretty cool, but not the same thing here. Jericho brought Pineapple Pete up to his level and showed everybody who he was. What he's doing with Cassidy right now, and he's he's, he's giving Orange Cassidy just a platform and a stage for Cassidy to show the world what he can do because nobody was paying attention and they were too sidetracked by his gimmick and everything else. Now he's going to be on the, on the top stage with Jericho, and now, now Cassidy is going to earn his big name in the industry. I love this. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, it's going to be great. Um... 
listen, I'll be the first one to tell you, I didn't get the, the gimmick of Orange Cassidy. I didn't care about it. I thought it was exactly what Jericho said tonight. It was an embarrassment to the business. And now Orange Cassidy may be, and I'm not uh, stroking his cock or his ego or anything like that, but he may be one of my favorite acts in all pro wrestling right now. Just, just between the way he could be the character and then fucking turn it on at 100 miles an hour. I mean, we talked about this last week. It takes a very talented individual to do that. And I honestly think with all the criticism that the character does get, I honestly think it's one of the most entertaining aspects in all of pro wrestling right now. Well, if, if nothing else, he's a lightning rod for conversation about the business as a whole. And um, he, and he is easily, definitely, if not the one of the best characters in wrestling, not named MJF, of course. But other than that, I mean, you, I mean, I, I, look, I understand why the purest and the old school guys crap on it. I get it. But I can see the entertainment value in it, especially, especially if the guy can go like he can go, and we know he can go. So that being said, I don't need to see him at his top form performing the best way that he can at all times. I know he can do it, and I know he gives it to us in increments, so we always want more of it. And everything he does in between is so entertaining. I love it. Yeah, man. We're going to talk about that match a little bit later. Probably go over some preview and predictions for Fighter Fest as well. Not particularly that match, because night two... Uh, Jericho and Cassidy is happening, but we'll at least do night one. We'll go over the entire card and then give our predictions as well for night one. Uh, we got uh, Sammy Guevara, talk of the town in AEW, suspended without pay. I believe Tony Khan is donating his pay as well to a prominent women's group. Uh, so that's good on them. I'm glad that they actually embrace this situation and are speaking out with everybody coming out with all of their stories. The pro wrestling world is being cleaned up, and rightfully so. Some of these guys I actually called matches for, and I'm actually embarrassed to have called matches for some of these people. Not Sammy in particular, but uh, following Guevara's suspension, that match was obviously changed. Him and Hardy were supposed to go one-on-one. -on -one. Now it's Hardy and Santana. We will talk about Sammy Guevara at least a little bit because I do have the majority of the story for Friday lined up on the podcast, but me and Jesse are going to go over that today and what he said to Sasha Banks and what Sasha said to him and so on and so forth. The world goes round. Brian Cage was in action tonight. John Moxley not there. Another talk of the town moment here in the world of pro wrestling. CV-19 running rampant, uh, not only in California and Florida, but now apparently the world of pro wrestling. Moxley, uh, due to COVID fears, he was not at the show tonight. We don't know if his wife has it or... His wife was around anybody in WWE who had it. We don't know who in the WWE has been tested positive for it. All we know, it somehow made its way to John Moxley, but he was not at the show tonight. Brian Cage was there with Taz. We'll go over what they did and what they said tonight as well. QT Marshall is another one who was told to stay home. He was supposed to have a match with Dustin against FTR tonight, so that match was changed. We had Frankie Kazarian and Christopher Daniels of SCU take on FTR. And Jesse, one of the big stories coming out of that match probably didn't even happen in the match, which was fucking fantastic. But Scorpio Sky, still a part of SCU, but he will not be a prominent tag team wrestler anymore. He is now strictly a singles competitor, leaving the tag team duties of SCU to Frankie Kazarian and Christopher Daniels. What do you think about that decision? You can tell they were kind of setting this up, and they were grooming him for that spot. And he is the money in SCU, and everybody can kind of see that. So, I, I get it. I like it. And I, I think he'll flourish. I think he'll do well. Um, Don't you think the tag team of SCU just being Frankie Kazarian and, and Christopher Daniels, don't you think it has now a shorter lifespan because of Daniels' age? That was the one thing I was thinking about. Like, what do they does. what do they do when Daniels doesn't go anymore? Is Frankie going to be a singles competitor now? Does SCU disband completely and the SCU brand dies? That's probably that's probably the goal. Um, they'll probably release Scorpio into the singles uh, world as a as a as a babyface, leave SCU together, and then maybe they'll have Frankie turn on um on God damn it have have, have Frankie turn on on the dock and and just kind of. Kill him. Okay. And I mean, I, I think about it. I mean, have Frankie turn on Daniels, 
in this career, maybe that maybe that tag team ends in a in a in a in a um career versus career match, something like that. I mean, you know, he has to he uh, the angel has to retire at some point soon. So it's just a matter of how they're gonna do it. Yeah, he does. Uh, here's here's yeah. a suggestion for them. Why don't we just have Frankie Kazarian join the Dark Order with everybody else? Nah, he's he's he's, he's, <laughs> better, he's better than that. He's I'm just that. joking, but uh, that <laughs> is being set up. Not not him joining, but Dark Order versus uh, SCU uh, being planned for Fighter Fest. Luchasaurus yeah. and Wardlow lumberjack match. I fucking hate lumberjack matches. Everybody knows this if you've been listening to me. If you're an OG of the channel, I fucking hate lumberjack matches. So when I seen a lumberjack match happen tonight, and I called the fucking action before I seen it, I was not a happy human being. But we got a lumberjack match between Luchasaurus and Wardlow. Two physically dominating men that I definitely want to see more of in AEW. We'll go over that match and what happened there and how that led to MJF getting involved and MJF getting himself a Fighter Fest match. We'll go over that as well. Uh, Brody Lee and Colt Cabana versus Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss. We'll talk about that as well. Have no interest in anything going on here with Janela or Sonny Kiss. I actually picked up the remote control and switched over to NXT during the match. Pardon me. And we got Hikaru Shida also in action tonight. And a press conference with Cody Rhodes and Jake Hager for the TNT Championship. Now, Jesse, I see, well, obviously we're going to go over what was said, but the presentation of this, what did you think of it? And do you want to see more of it like me in pro wrestling? Or is it just too much UFC style? It is, it is very UFC style, but I don't dislike it because of that. UFC has taken plenty of aspects of pro wrestling and implemented them into into Dana's form of entertainment. But um I don't think this is something that wrestling should stay away from because UFC does it more often. I, I think this is this is fine. This is fine. The thing about pro wrestling is when they get something that gets over, they do it too much. Yeah. So as as long as this doesn't become a, a something that they, that they do for every main event or I don't know every big pay per view as long as they don't do this for every other few they have, then I'm okay with it. I kind of like it. Yeah. You know, and, and don't dedicate it to only Cody's promo. I mean, you got to spread it around. I mean, why don't, why wouldn't we see this for the next main event, you know, with, you know, Wardlow and uh, and someone. I mean, let's do the, do the same thing, that, you know. Yeah. Don't, don't have it be Cody all the time. Obviously, yeah. I know why they did it for Cody now, but mm -hmm. they got to do it when it actually is of epic importance, I think. You just can't do yeah. it all the time and have every fucking uh, pay-per-view end in a uh, press conference like we've seen tonight. But, yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. But we'll go over what was said there. Jake Hager and Cody Rhodes really like the presentation there and how they presented the TNT Championship. So, so we got a loaded show here, guys. So thank you so much for joining us right here on Off The Script. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That is on Twitter and Instagram. If you guys would like to follow Jesse, his Twitter account is right there underneath his camera in the layout on the podcast tonight. If you guys are following me on social media, thank you for tweeting live with me tonight during Dynamite. As soon as, soon as this is over, I'm going to go back and watch NXT, and then we'll be live on YouTube tomorrow talking NXT. Uh, also, if you guys missed my Monday Night Raw review, go and check that out. Epic rant on why Dolph Ziggler should not be the number one contender and how uh, Bruce is slowly ruining Monday Night Raw. So if you guys want your fill of a logical booking... Then go watch my Monday Night Raw review. Almost an hour and a half worth of content over there. And like I said, I'll be live during NXT for the live stream tomorrow as usual. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. If you guys want to show some extra appreciation, hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for all notifications. And tonight's podcast is brought to you by Audible. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. Go and get your new Jim Ross book, Under the Black Hat, free audio version, now read by Jim Ross. Helps me out, helps Audible out. It's a great deal. You're getting something for free just for listening to two schmucks talk AEW tonight. So thank you guys so very much for that. Anyway, anyway, start at the top. Luchasaurus and Wardlow, Lumberjack match. Jesse, I fucking hate Lumberjack matches. You can always call a Lumberjack match every single time. Every Lumberjack match ends up the same way with the blithering idiots on the outside, either catching somebody or fighting AEW did the logical thing, putting the baby faces on one side and the heels on the other. And Luchasaurus and Warlow are just both physically impressive individuals. I know we both talked about Luchasaurus a couple of weeks back. Did what he did here tonight 
Change your mind on Luchasaurus. Nope. He's still the same old Luchasaurus. He needs something more. He didn't br break out of that shell that you thought he was kind of nestling himself into. Nope. Made it worse. He made it worse. How so? The match was great. The match was fantastic. There's nothing wrong with the match. But same old stuff from Luchasaurus. Same old stuff from Luchasaurus. Same same comeback spots. Same moves. Same. I mean, it's same stuff from him, man. So it's it's safe to say that Wardlow impressed you more than Luchasaurus did. Oh yeah. I mean, and why? Because we haven't seen as much from Wardlow, and every time we see him, he shows us a little bit more different things from his arsenal. So I'm enjoying Wardlow. Absolutely. You know, I, I did not really know Wardlow before AEW, and I honestly think he is, he's very good. You know, I didn't yes. think he was going to be very good. I thought, and this is me because I'm such a fucking nitpicker and I'm very picky with the people that I actually mm -hmm. invest my time in. I thought he was going to be very one dimensional. I, I honestly thought he was going to be like the next Ryback, to be honest with you. And I fucking hate putting him in that because he's so much more physically dominating than Ryback and he's more athletic than Ryback as well. But Warlow is definitely coming along. You know, I was even getting, if, I know MJF is groomed for the world championship, but if AEW wants to test the waters as well and maybe kind of hold off on that and hold off on MJF getting that world championship, I could absolutely see a team of MJF and Wardlow dominating the tag team division at some point. I think they would be a great duo to kind of just put into that, that title contention and be like, you know what? We got another great solid duo of guys right here that are fucking legit. Uh Probably could not disagree with that anymore. I mean, really? they have they have enough. I know, I know, I know that deserve and need a push for us to just take two guys who can be in the world title picture, put them together, call them the tag team champions. Well, we are getting Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy versus MJF and Wardlow at Fighter Fest, so it's like it made me think. Oh, that's a that's like a nice headline tag team title yeah. future match. Somewhere down the line, you know? Use use your idea. You put these two guys together and have them face Kenny and Hangman. And now we get four singles competitors in a tag division full of great tag teams. What the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is no. the shit I think about when I watch the goddamn show. <laughs> no, that's stupid. <laughs> no. These guys are great. Leave them how they are. Have they are. I see where you're going with it, yeah. And 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 with that, maybe we can dabble into the TV title picture a little bit. You know, have them maybe you know yeah. har harass Cody for his title a little bit. You know, just kind of before they get to the top where they're gonna be, then we're gonna break them up and then have them feud with each other. I mean, they they got gold right there in those two, but right now I think they're doing the right thing. They gotta build up Warlow to get them somewhere remotely and keep them remotely close to the level of MJF because when MJF strikes gold, Warlow was an awesome opponent. Yeah, yeah, I can see it happening for sure. Uh, yep. Warlow in this thing, he tried to uh, pull Luchasaurus's mask off at one point. They ended up fighting on the ramp and to the stage where Warlow landed a power slam, which looked very good. Lumberjacks began fighting, of course, because fuck Lumberjack matches. After Luchasaurus knocked Warlow into the Lumberjacks, Luchasaurus landed a shooting star press onto the crowd below. I know, Jesse, you had a problem with this as well. Uh, first of all, I love some of this. I, I, I mostly disliked all of this. But the spot with Marco Stunt where Wardlow picked up Marco Stunt and like fucking flung him into space and then he landed on everybody about seven seconds later because Wardlow launched him so high. That looked great. Everything else looked fucking ridiculous. Wardlow jumping in, uh, getting thrown by Luchasaurus and then Luchasaurus doing a very impressive shooting star press. I would like to see that done in the ring, but when I got 17 or 18 fucking guys out there just looking up as if they're looking at uh, a shooting star and they're waiting to make a wish, please, I hope no female comes at me on social media, you know. They're all looking up at the star, wishing upon a star, waiting for this guy to jump. He didn't even fucking jump. He did a double take, and then he jumped, and they're all waiting there. How ridiculous... Does this fucking look when you see this shit happen every single week? Please tell me you're just sick of seeing these idiots look up there like, oh, yeah. I mean, well, but before I get to that, I, I, I saved this on the whole night. I saved this part for you. I don't 
hate lumberjack matches. <laughs> oh yeah? Oh I I don't I don't hate your role model. I think she's fantastic. <laughs> Fuck you, man. She's, <laughs> she's terrible. <laughs> and she's <laughs> drinking an apple martini tonight. So she's oh. got good taste in cold beverages. Oh. I love me an apple martini when it's right. Look, stay focused, man. Lumberjack matches. Yes. Yes. God. Look at these idiots. Look, what do you what do you think of these idiots just waiting? Yeah. There? Yeah, those spot. Look, if you're gonna do a lumberjack match, here, here's here's why I don't hate lumberjack matches, because I I, I, I see what they wanted to do. You want to tell multiple stories at one time, and also the entire goal is to get a winner from this match and protect the loser. So that is the goal. You get a lot of interference, and then look, as long as the lumberjacks have a story to tell and they tell it, and it kind of evolves and tells two stories at once. Essentially, what they're going to do is they're going to progress two feuds at one time, maybe even three or four, depending on who the Lumberjacks are. So for that reason, I get it. Now, I just don't think this match was well produced because those spots, well, yeah, they were just they were just kind of, they they, they, made, they looked like lame ducks. And the double take by Luchasaurus, I mean, for safety reasons, I get it, but the aesthetics of it does not look no. good when everyone's sitting there waiting to catch them. I mean, it looks terrible. Yeah, it looked terrible. So he landed that. And he obviously got back in the ring with Wardlow. So he went for a cover. MJF got up on the apron. He distracted the referee. Jungle Boy jumped him. So that's obviously continuing their storyline, which I have no problems with at all because the match that they had at the pay-per-view was fucking great. Probably the best match of the night. And then Wardlow hit a low blow. And his F-10, is he's calling it. The <laughs> yeah. F-10. It's not an F-5. It's an F-10. No. So he hit the F10 for the win. Ross said the low blow is what did it. They showed MJF clutching his ribs after the match was over. And then Jungle Boy attacked. Crowd entered the ring for the pull apart brawl. And there was over a dozen wrestlers in the ring, a.k.a. a shitty lumberjack situation on Dynamite. But I do agree yeah. with Jesse. I do think that they advanced multiple storylines here. That's the reason why the match was done. It protected Luchasaurus and Wardlow. Um... Yeah. What did you think? Does Luchasaurus suffer anything from from this loss, or is it? Does it really protect him? Protect him, or is it like? Eh? Well, for for look for for me, the 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 guy that's gonna sit here and analyze every little thing they do, I don't think it protected him enough. But but God knows, commentary did their job and they put it over and sold the fact that Luchasaurus would not have lost this match had not have been the you know. For Someone MJF. cheating. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, so it, that being said, they did their job. I mean, I just, I mean, it just, to me, it just seems like, you know, you get a low blow by a heel. You're shocked by this? You know, come on. That's no reason to lose a match. Yeah. You know, but, you know, that, that's just me. But they did protect them. So in that case, in that aspect, I do like the fact that they're not giving up on Luchasaurus. I just think that he, he and Jungle Boy can benefit from some better booking and a little bit of a push into that into that top tag team division that they have, they could be big players in it. They need to be big players in it. Yeah, I, I think that's coming. I think I think you're a you're right on that for sure. But I do think that's coming because FTR, uh, Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler actually did mention them by name, so you know that they're on FTR's good. hit list. So hopefully that also, is that is good. I, I hope I also hope they're just not gonna now rebuild Jurassic Express to feed them to FTR because they want to. Catapult FTR to the top. Well, I, I, well, that's the thing. Everybody's going to be fed to FTR. I mean, they, they, I they're going to be they're going to be the most unstoppable tag team in the business by the end of this thing, for sure. I wouldn't. I wouldn't give them their hot start. Let them run through some lower to mid card guys and. Stop I would. I, I wouldn't cold. even book the match. I, I wouldn't. I would. I would nope. do exactly what you're probably thinking. It's fucking uh, have yep. FTR run through everybody and then have uh, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy do their mm -hmm. own thing and start doing the same thing FTR is doing and then have Luchasaurus and yeah. Jungle Boy. Fucking beat yep. FTR for the titles. Yeah, stop. I would, I would stop them cold. I would stop them before they get to the title shots because between Jurassic Express, between the Lucha Bros, there's plenty of uh, of more qualified teams who's been there longer who deserve to have at least a shot at those titles before FTR. Nothing wrong with FTR getting a little bit of a push, but what's the fucking hurry? Relax. Yeah. They're here. They're here. You know, let let us move out, build their name up, get to the live crowds. Let's get these guys. Let's let's establish if they're heels or faces. I like what they're doing here. We don't know what the hell they're doing with these guys yet. Yeah, yeah it's still well, it's still kind of gray. So yep. 
I'm liking what they're doing there. So we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Tag Team Division, obviously, is uh, just on fire. So we could talk about this all night, just the Tag Team Division in itself. But we got uh, the rest of a two-hour show here to mosey on through. We got Taz. I love what they did here. Taz had a scouting report vignette as he uh, detailed Brian Cage's offense, of course. Moxley, you are in great danger when you defend your title at Fighter Fest against Brian Cage. So I'm liking what they're doing there. And then, then we go to Britt Baker. Then we go to Britt Baker, who's encased, my friend, in plexiglass. She borrowed some from the fucking Performance Center because they ain't utilizing it correctly. So she said, you know what, baby, go get me some fucking plexiglass. I got to sit here next to Tony Schiavone and I got to drink some apple martinis. She had two people guarding her, one wearing a bandana mask and then the other one was Stella, her assistant. And she just stood there handing notes or sat there rather drinking and handing notes to Tony. Doesn't she look so role modelish tonight? Yeah, she looked awesome, bro. <laughs> I mean, just top tier stuff. It's excellent. It's becoming the She's Charlotte now on TV AEW. more than Charlotte Flair. Look at that. She is the Charlotte Flair of AEW. Minus the elective surgery. Wink, wink. Yeah, but guess what? And and I dare you to fight me on this. Charlotte is at least a better wrestler than Britt Baker. Well, I, I'm not going to disagree with you there. I'm not, I mean, I'm no fool. I mean, this. I'm just saying, man. At least if we got to look at Charlotte every damn week... At least we're going to look at some halfway decent women's wrestling, so. <laughs> well, we're going to get some decent wrestling when she comes back. Jesus Christ. Moving on. We did we, we did have Hikaru Shida on the show, at least. She defeated Red Velvet. So this one uh, was very quick. It was le legitimately a squash. Well, uh, Ross noted that Shida has a 11-1 singles record in 2020. Very impressive there. I uh, love the commentary. I think they've been on top of the, This is the best the commentary team has sounded all year. Just want to yes. throw that out there. I've, I've, said, I've said that for the last couple of weeks. When I remember when they when they launched AEW, me, you, and everybody else who watched it said, yeah, we, don't know, yeah. we don't know why JR is here. I mean, this is not his game anymore. This is not 1997. This is not the same thing. He can't keep doing this. Dude, the last, the last couple of weeks, JR has been in rare form. Awesome stuff. He's he's back. He's back to right where I remember Jr. It's almost like he he's doing. He has the he has the chemistry that he had with King without a partner like King. He's just doing it by himself. He's probably his better work than with 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 WWE because he doesn't have a King to bounce off of. Like yeah, that. and it's amazing how how just they're they're so unscripted. Like Tony Khan lets them go out there and he that that's the level of trust he has in a Tony Schiavone and a Jim Ross and then Excalibur is just kind of following suit. You know, we all thought he was going to th be the third wheel, but they all gel so beautifully together. And I don't want to sit here and harp on it too much, but yes, they've been excellent as of late. And to be to be quite fair with the, the transition WWE is going through right now, some of their shows are just unwatchable. Their commentary teams are really suffering right now in the middle of these uh, PC shows. AEW's commentary team, commentary team is standing out more so than even Moro and Beth Phoenix on NXT. And I'm not even afraid to admit that. And I love Moro. So I think they're doing a great job. Uh, Excalibur and Tony Schiavone went over Hikaru Shida's win-loss record as well with Jim Ross 11-1. They hyped the Fighter Fest uh, match with um, Penelope Ford coming up. So obviously Penelope Ford and Kip Sabian at ringside watching this match. Shida got into a verbal back and forth with Penelope Ford. Ford took a sheep shot at Sheeta, slapping her. Sheeta tried to hit her with her kendo stick. The referee blocked it and ordered her to get back in the ring. Sheeta won in seconds, then promptly leapt to the floor and got into it with Ford. Uh, Sabian helped separate them and yelled at Sheeta. And Jesse, I'm not sure if you've seen while this pull-apart brawl was happening there, we had Ricky Starks pulling Sheeta away, and then we had uh, Kip Sabian pulling his fiance away. In the crowd, I'm not sure if you picked up on this, there was a former NXT talent in the crowd, not really known to a lot of people, but it was Cesar Bononi, if you remember him from NXT. He was there right on camera, so we don't know if he signed to AEW or not, or if he's just visiting, quote-unquote, friends and family. What'd you think about that? Did you pick that up? No, I know the name. I know the name, but I I never would have recognized the face without, you know, knowing. I, I, don't, I don't know his face necessarily, so I didn't know about that. So, I mean... No, I mean, I don't know. It's not going to change anything. 
I mean, but it's interesting. Yeah. Now we'll figure that out uh, as the uh, days go on, see if uh, Meltzer or any of those guys talk about that in the days to come. Sheeta wins with a Falcon's arrow, and that was pretty much it. So it's going to be her and Penelope Ford at Fighter Fest for the Women's Championship. We had the press conference with Cody and a very absent Jake Hager, or I would say a very casually late uh, Jake Hager. He was there, but he didn't show up until the end with his wife. But AEW started the press conference without him. And we had a woman from AEW. I forgot her name. She's obviously an assistant to Cody and management. Cody, Arn Anderson, Brandy Rhodes, and Dustin Rhodes were all there. We had some random guy that I didn't recognize at first holding up the title, very UFC style, behind Cody Rhodes. Uh, This management representative asked uh, for questions in the crowd. And there were... Obviously, dirt sheet, notable dirt sheet names being thrown out, PW Insider, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody asked Arn the first question and asked if he was surprised Hager wasn't there. Arn said he's not surprised. He said the timing is not right for Hager despite being a big badass. Arn says he pushed Cody's buttons and got him to challenge Hager. He said not showing up at the press conference is disrespecting him. It's only... Showing me one of two things. One, you're either doubting yourself or you're just too stupid to get up and put a brave front. He said when all is done, they'll have a champion in Cody Rhodes still at the end of Fighter Fest. So she threw it to Matt Brock from PWI. And obviously these were scripted questions. They weren't really legitimate original questions. And we got a question about the TNT Championship. What is... The feeling of being the first ever TNT champion. And then, very hard-hitting question, obviously, from these uh, dirt sheets. That's the best they could do. Cody said he still believes in the American dream, and it gives him hope still. He said last week, Arn selected Ricky Starks, who had $3.67 to his name before coming to Dynamite, and he left Dynamite with a job in AEW. He said he is a bit of a Boy Scout who does the work, and... I'm sorry here. My notes are all fucking up. So Cody was talking about Ricky Starks, Boy Scout who does the work, which doesn't sit well with everybody. He said he takes wrestling seriously because wrestling has fed him since he was born. I don't like meta wrestling, says Cody. I don't like play wrestling. I don't like cosplay wrestling. I like professional wrestling. So clearly this has some WWE uh, undertones to it. Uh, you yeah. could think about uh, that if you want, but it reminded me of uh, Cody just kind of taking a small little stab, just a slight stab at WWE. said he likes to fight like, uh, he likes the taste of his own blood. He likes to fight. He said they provide a service for the fans at home as he talked about the TNT title belt being incomplete. So Jake Hager walks in through the side entrance with his wife. Hager and Cody got face-to-face. Hager asked Cody if he's ready. They went face-to-face. And Hager called for a cameraman, so they struck a pose very UFC style. And Cody slapped Hager's arm away because Hager put a fist right to Cody's jaw. And Cody said, it's all good, it's all good. Hager's wife then takes a glass of water and throws it in Cody's face. Dustin started yelling for security, get her off the stage now, get her out of here. And that was the end of the, I would say, press conference, contract signing, whatever you want to call it. What do you think of this, Jesse? Did you like it? What did you think about Hager and Cody? Doesn't need a press conference like this. Did AEW go too far in making this seem more important than it really is? Talk to me. I thought it was, I thought it was well done for what it was, um, and I like it. I like how they, do, I like how they take the serious approach to it. You know how wrestling contract. Um, signings and things like that have to end in the ridiculous over-the-top physical melee. I got some breaking news. You got some breaking news now. Renee Young just came out and admitted that she herself, in fact, has COVID-19. Wow. She wow. has just tweeted herself, man, what a few days, my show gets canceled and I get COVID. Wear your mask and wash your hands. Stay safe, everyone. Renee Young. Holy shit. Yep. When was the Jeff. last time we seen her on television? Not that long ago. We seen her on television Friday with the AJ Styles uh, championship uh, celebration there with Matt Riddle and AJ and Daniel Bryan. Yes, sir. 
So, everyone so if she throw, has it, and there was every, already two dozen, over two dozen, according to Mike Johnson, the PW Insider, over two dozen WWE staff, employees, in-ring talent, producers, cameramen, etc. Could they be a couple of the people that got it from Renee Young? It, I mean, that's speculating. Renee Young could be passing it. Renee Young could be someone who caught it from someone else who came in with it. Who knows? But she has it. And whoever that she was in the ring with during her segment, I would be looking at right away. And whoever she was in the women's locker room with, I would also be looking at right away. This is serious. Wow. There you go, folks. Breaking news. Uh, A, hopefully she gets through this and is on the road to recovery sooner rather than later. Uh, John Moxley, obviously taking off tonight's show. We'll talk about him in a little bit. But there you go, folks. Again, wow. all of this uh, CV-19 stuff. Just kind of wrecking havoc in pro wrestling, period. AEW, WWE, more so for WWE in their negligence. This is what they get for not following protocol. But we'll talk about that on Friday as I uncover more of this on, uh, on, on Friday's Off the Script. But yeah. we, go, we, we go from... from I was uh, like, get, get well soon, Renee and John. I'm sure John probably has it now as well. So get well, both of you. Y yeah, um... Apparently he's going to be at Fighter Fest, is what they said. Tonight. Now, unless he unless he never came back to her and he's been quarantined from her. Yeah. If he's home, if he's home with her, he has it, bro. Yeah, yeah. So that's another that's another part of the story we don't know. But yes, get well, uh, Renee and John Moxley and whoever has it in the WWE. Just a shitty situation right now. Vignette with Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela in a car. Sonny said, "If anyone can relate to him, it's her." Sonny said they lose themselves every now and then, and they said they should switch places so Joey can drive. These are very well produced. Whoever's producing these is doing a very good job. Uh, they filmed Janela and Sonny Kiss at a gas station. Some guys gave Sonny a hard time. Sonny fought them off as Janela shopped and began eating a burrito. Uh, he was eating a burrito out, outside. He walked back to the car. They fought off the attackers, and it was very cinematic. They hopped in the car. They left, and they drove away. But Sonny saying, I can get used to this. And that was it. What do you think of this tag team? What do you think of this pairing? Is it going to work? Is it short term? Sonny Kiss and Joey Janelle. I'm not going to lie. Everybody's probably sitting here waiting for at least you to sit here and rage on this. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, man. Because I watch Dark and I've been watching these. And so I, I actually had high hopes for this tag team. And I'll explain why. Because... Sunny Kiss is looked at as nothing more than a joke and, and the, too much comedy and over the top. And I was hoping that this was going to be a chance for Joey to bring out a more serious side and a more competitive side and the wrestler side of of, of the concrete rose. You know, I... I, I seriously, I thought it was going to be, okay, well, we know he's flamboyant. We know he's this. We know he's that. But guess what? The guy's killing it. He goes into this serious streak. No, man. No, it's no. It's it's as bad as it sounds. I tried. I'm not I'm not shitting on this because of who he is and what it, I'm shitting on it because after giving it a few weeks, it's terrible. It's god awful, man. Yeah, I um listen. I don't mean anybody any disrespect. They're obviously both from Jersey. It's probably the primary reason why they paired them up together. But man, oh man, Joey Janela has fallen so far off the tree in AEW uh, where he was super fucking just badass and cool with Penelope Ford. And now he's hanging around Sonny Kiss. I mean, I, I, I can't even put it into words how far he's fallen. But Sonny Kiss does absolutely nothing for me in the ring at all. It's all, it's all a fucking, I, I don't even know how to put it into words. It's just, it's just not for me. I, I can't, you know, I'm going to be blatantly honest with you guys. I cannot watch a guy sit there or stand there and twerk in front of another guy in the ring and call that pro wrestling. Everybody wants to make fun of fucking flips and dives and this and that. He's a vanilla midget. He's uh, flipping and diving acrobatics and fucking gymnastics, whatever. I can't watch a guy doing fucking twerking in the ring, dude, and throwing, throwing Alexa Bliss like slaps in the ring. I shit on that. I'm going to shit on this. It's complete fucking just garbage. It really is. I agree. It is I egregious. Agree. It's, it's really, it's really for, for a pro wrestling fucking podcast and a pro wrestling mind like, like mine and, and like Jesse's, it's just fuck. it's sheer garbage. 
And, and, and I'm glad he's got a job. I'm glad he's got a job with AEW. I really am. But it's I, not for I, me. I just, Keep I it on dark. They, Keep it I, on dark. Get yeah. it away from me. I think they missed a golden opportunity to make a new mid mid card level star right here. They could have had. I, I would have had him on dark, being the flamboyant, concrete, sunny rose. And then when he has his shows on dynamite, turn him into. That's the serious badass who does all the serious moves and they have a serious tag team. It would have been it would have been interesting to see like he's like this on dark, but he's like this. It would have been interesting to, to I mean, for at least a little bit. I could see him in a match with Cody Rhodes for a TV title if they took his character serious as they did as serious as they do as they take his comedy side. Just have a flip switch right there. This is this is really just the bottom of the barrel for Joey Janela. This is pretty much Tony Khan telling him, "Bro, we got nothing for you. We're gonna pay you with Sunny Kiss. You guys work together on the Indies in uh, in Jersey and in New York. We're gonna pay it together on Dynamite." I, I listen. A lot of people are saying the, the the wrong team won here, Jesse. The wrong team won here. You're gonna have Brody Lee, a fucking professional wrestler, lose to Sunny Kiss and Joey Janela on Dynamite. I don't think so, bro. I don't think so. A lot of people are saying that Cole Cabana should have continued losing and Brody Lee should have continued to bring down the hammer on Cole Cabana and really kind of just bring out that evil side in him. But I don't think so. Honestly. No. I mean, it, to me, it looks like that they, they were clearly just building these two up just to get them a nice little record and a little credibility to try to feed them to someone they were building in the tag division. There, there, there was no intent to take these two serious. Yeah. So we're going to go over this a little bit. Lee hits some power moves and kiss tag doubts after some theatrics that I will not go over here. Lee dropped Janela with a shoulder block and tagged Cabana, giving instructions on how to attack from the apron. Cabana was immediately cut off. Kiss and Janela hit some nice tandem offense, including a heart attack clothesline. Yes, folks. They awesome. mimicked Bret Hart and Jim the Anvil Nightheart's finishing move on Dynamite. Kiss tagged in, used a crab on Cabana. Lee interfered to break it up. Dark Order Creepers interfered and Cabana got uh, some heel heat on Sunny Kiss. Lee and Cabana used some quick tags and working over Sunny Kiss during a commercial break. After the break, Cabana missed the flying apple. Janela got a tag. He flipped off Lee, hit a DVD, Death Valley Driver on Cabana for a two count. Janela hit a moonsault off the post onto Lee to the floor. Kiss then hit a... Terrible looking moonsault off the post to Cabana on the floor. Barely grazed him. He got more of the rib barricade outside the ring than he did Cabana. Back in the ring, Kiss hit Cabana with a 450, which was sloppily done as well. Janela covered, but Lee broke up the pin. Cabana slid out of a doomsday device and used a cradle on Janela for a two count. Kiss hit a high cross off the post onto Alex Reynolds and John Silver. Lee hit Kiss with a lariat to the floor. Janela then tried a tope suicida, but Lee threw Janela into the barricade. Lee then hit Janela with a discus lariat and allowed Cabana to cover. There you go, my my son. Go make the cover and get your win from your father. So Cabana gets the cover on Janela for the pin, and that was it. So Lee raised Cabana's hand after the win. Cabana was happy that he finally got a pinfall victory here, thanks to Brody Lee. Mr. Brody Lee, by the way. So Kiss helped Janela out of the ring, and then all of a sudden... This was the best part of the match because I fucking smiled from ear to ear with this one. Lance Archer, the murder hawk, comes out, lays both <laughs> of them out, and we got Joey Janela and Lance Archer now at Fighter Fest. So what do you think about that one? It's uh, Lance Archer's time to feast, I think. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, they, they, needed a, they needed a snack. They needed a snack for the, for the, for the murder hawk, man. I don't think this is going to end well for Joey. No, it's gonna Not be great. It's gonna be glorious. It's they be... might, they might, they might give him. They might give them ten minutes. I mean, but hey, whatever. Hey, listen, the, 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 Janela, is Janela has Stella. not looked weak in anything he's done. But besides this tonight, he's looked pretty decent in everything he's done. You know, he's had some great matches with Kenny. But I mean, yeah. like I said, this is this is the fucking bottom of the barrel here. Well, this, but this, but that's, but that's gonna be his job for this match. Janela is a phenomenal seller. You know, and we, what do we need Archer to do? We need him to look great. Well, Janela's gonna bump for him. He's gonna look awesome about that. I mean, it'll, it, he's, he'll do his job. But I mean, this this match has one ending that we all know it's gonna come to. Now we can. It'd be interesting to see if we get some kind of interference and some kind of pop up from um 
from Archer's next opponent, maybe. But other than that, that was that was yeah. my next question to you. Who, who do you think they put Lance Archer against next? Because I'm not worried about him and Janela. I know what the outcome's going to yeah. be. What, what, what do they do? What would you do if you had the pen and paper? How would you book Lance Archer going into All Out? Oh boy, I'm looking at if I'm looking at Lance Archer, we got a we got a dominant heel. I'm I'm looking at. Oh wow, so this is this is a good one. But what I what I want to see, what I want to get to, I mean, we can't get to that by the next pay per view more than likely. But I want to see Archer and Omega. I mean, that is what I I want to see. But immediately, what's next for Archer? I I don't I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I, don't, I, I, I kind of get. I kind of get that vibe too. Like yet. I don't. I don't know what you would do with him. It's like he's yeah. like he's so good at what he does, but he's also kind of lost right now. Everybody, everybody that you want to see him in a match against is kind of tied up doing their own thing right now. I was thinking that the one guy that jumps off the page for me and Lance Archer is is Hangman. Yeah, and that's why I said Hangman or or Kenny, but I said they're they're tied up, you know. And so I don't I don't know. I don't want to see him with Mox just yet. But here's something that nobody's really touched on this yet. AEW is very, and this is why I can't think of anything to do with Archer. AEW is very heel heavy right now. And yeah. they their 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 best their best talent right now are, are are pretty much all heels. I mean it's a it's a good problem to have as long as your baby faces are over. Um, but we kind of need them spread out because once you get past Cody and Moxley, who are your top tier singles baby faces? Because you put Kenny and Hagman together in a tag team. I think the only other one they have right now is Darby, but they're saving him for Cage. Yeah, Darby's not ready yet for that top spot. No, I mean so it's they have two top baby faces and one is the mid card champion and then orange cassidy's another one they got some oh. it's just again everybody's tired of doing their own fucking thing yeah yeah you gotta you mean you gotta get those i've, I've been i've been you know saying and thinking this for a while you gotta get those tag titles off of omega and hangman you gotta let these guys go hangman was not at the spot where you wanted him to be when you launched but now he is so let's break. And this they did their they did their job with those tag team championships. Yes, so they, you know, you know uh, start selling the breakup or, or whatever the fuck you're gonna do with both of them. And yes. uh, Ken, Kenny needs to be in that in that world title hunt, no question. Yep. Yes. You know, absolutely. And they got they got more than enough tag teams to supply fucking three organizations. Never mind just AEW. So well, they they I, definitely need to start spreading the wealth singles wise. It's gonna make the overall roster a little bit more even. I do agree with that. Uh, well, I think when they split that tag team up. I think whoever comes out heel in that is probably has a date with Cody after that. I could see that. So, but yeah. I think that's going to be Hangman, and then Omega goes for uh, the world title. Yeah, you know, and well, he, he might have to deal with Pack Pack again as well. He's going to be coming. That's back another. Soon. That's you know, he's the wild card. No, no, nobody's talking about him. We've seen uh, yep. the Lucha Brothers come back tonight. Phoenix yeah. was hurt. Pentagon uh, travel restrictions held him in Mexico. So, yeah, Pac is another one that nobody's talking about. Another solid name. When you look up and down the AEW roster, they got they got a damn good roster. Got a lot to they do with it. I'm just kind of worried about putting my trust in a UK wrestler these days. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, let's keep it positive. Let's keep it We're positive no here on the show. Let me, let, me, let me take that back. We're no better over here. We, we've got plenty I of know. dirty laundry over here in our side. I know. And so. Speaking of positive, man, I have nothing but positive to say about FTR. Holy shit, man. When, when you look at FTR in AEW, it, it's like legitimately, and I don't want to use this because it's such an overused analogy, it's like two fucking fat kids who have no care in the world walking into an ice cream shop and they're, they're looking at all the different flavors of ice cream and they want to taste a sample of literally all 32 flavors in the fucking freezer. It, it's, it's so great to see them actually in an organization that is going to let them be them. Man, this match with SCU tonight was fucking great. I enjoyed the match that they had last week. This was even yeah. better. This yeah, was great. You know, you know what? You, you know what the faces of of FTR look like to me this week. It looked the the same faces of Sasha and Bailey on NXT last week. That's exactly what I was gonna say. This is this is yeah. both of these guys NXT version, right? Yeah. Here. They just love what they do. Yeah. Love it. These guys had a great tag team match. Very old school with SCU. Like we said before in the open, Scorpio Sky is going singles. It's going to be Frankie Kazarian and Scorpio Sky leading SCU in the tag team division. That is until 
Christopher Daniels uh, doesn't want to do it anymore. Can't physically do it anymore. Until uh, that point, then we'll wonder what happens to SCU. But for now, we got the duo here. And they started the match off with FTR. FTR got the first little bit of offense on SCU. All four guys brawled. We went to a quick commercial. Harwood got a tag. Series of snap suplexes there by Dax Harwood. He had a slingshot suplex on Daniels, Jesse, and he threw up the four. He threw up the four. Are we seeing a rebirth of the four horsemen in AEW? Yeah. Cody yeah, did it. We got FTR doing it. What's going on here? They always say, I, I, I forget, I don't know which one is which, Dax or, I mean, the other, I mean, I, I, could, I couldn't tell them apart when they were at, at, the, at the revival stage, but the Arn Anderson uh, uh, Jr., yeah, you know, that that means he's that that could be his son. While I know they did DNA test that guy, <laughs> so if they want to redo a four horsemen stable and they want to put FTR in it, I will stand, applaud, and buy every T-shirt they manufacture. Me too. You know, <laughs> and, and I, listen, this was a, this was a topic of discussion uh, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about it. You know, obviously now is not, not is not the right time to do it. Obviously, mm-hmm. I would like to see something like this be born when fans are in attendance. Oh, yeah. But I'm already I'm already thinking we got Tully and Sean Spears together. Mm-hmm. Sean Spears got the black glove. I could see Tully scouting Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler. Could we see Sean Spears, FTR, and Cody become the new four horsemen? I like I like FTR in it. I like Cody in it. I'm trying to shoehorn Spears. Spears in it, but I can't. Yeah, man. the the other na- the other <laughs> name I was thinking about is maybe Hangman, but I I, I don't know if he would be right for that role. He he in 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 theory he would, but it's, in theory he would. It, yes. you know, just physically seeing him there, I don't think it'll work. Yes, in theory he would, but the direction they took with him and everything they've invested yeah. into getting the character where they want it right now to put him in a stable is it's just you just wasted everything that you built yeah. with him. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. In theory, yes, I would have put Hangman there. But now, where they have him, no. Maybe down the road in a few years, but just not right now. Um, I wouldn't do Spears. I would do. I would do an enforcer like a Wardlow or a you know a Archer or something like that, or Brian Cage. Yeah. Brian Cage. Yeah, I could so see I don't that. Know. I could see Brian Cage in a in a in a fucking Armani suit coming out with no shirt under it, <laughs> being an enforcer for the Four Horsemen. I could see that. Yeah, he could fit that Batista like role. Like Batista yes. was just so intimidating, wearing that fucking suit in Evolution, standing next to Orton and Triple H and Flair. He didn't say a fucking word. He knew he knew that he was like, yeah, nobody's gonna fuck with me, you know. Yes. But yes. Uh, I I like that and. You know, I'm thinking with, with all this four horsemen tease and shit with with, with uh, FTR and Cody dropping it, dropping little hints. You know, it, it's kind of mirroring what NXT did for the last couple of years going into war games. Undisputed Era has been such a vital role in NXT, and they pretty much own that war games match. It's almost as if AEW has pretty much supplied themselves with enough faction warfare to maybe have that blood and guts match when things get back to normal, I hope. And we mm-hmm. could see a kind of revised version of it. If this happens later on in the year or maybe next year, maybe Tony Khan's holding it till next year. Maybe we get the elite and the reborn four horsemen of 2020 in AEW in the blood and guts instead of the inner circle. But it seems like AEW setting themselves up for faction warfare. It, it could be the elite versus pretty much anybody at this point, And it'll be... A damn good fucking showdown, you know? It could be. But if if I had to guess at it, I would say that if if they do have a, a, a some kind of long-term, some kind of structural plan to do a full horseman reunion, I don't think it's going to happen until they're done with whatever what they want to do with the inner circle. Yeah. You don't want, you don't want the full horseman in there as a heel stable next to another top tier heel stable and I mean, it's not going to work. So maybe when Jericho goes to tour or maybe when he decides what he wants to do in the short term and everything like that, maybe they'll disband in a circle and then they'll shift their focus to the four horsemen. Yeah. And we'll see what happens with that. But faction warfare running wild in AEW. We got the rest of this match happened after the snap suplexes, slingshot suplex, the tease of the four. Kazarian took the referee 
And Daniels used an inside cradle on Harwood. Wheeler jumped in, reversed the cradle with the referee's back turned. The referee finally turned around. Daniels kicked out of the small package. Kazarian and Wheeler got tags. They traded shops and lariats. Kazarian hit a backstabber, which looked great, and an unprettier, which looked even better for a near fall, on Cash Wheeler. Daniels tagged in. Wheeler escaped an SCU later attempt and launched Daniels into the buckle. Wheeler held Daniels while Harwood hit a leg drop off the buckle for a two-count. Devastating leg drop. It almost looked as if he dropped all of his weight from his behind right on Daniels' face, which looked great. So Wheeler blind tagged in uh, at the end of this thing. Daniels hits Angel's wings on Harwood. Wheeler broke it up. Harwood cradled Daniels for a two. Wheeler blind tagged in. Wheeler and Harwood hit the Good Not Express, pin Daniels, and that was it for the tag team match. And we got FTR winning yet another match here on Dynamite. Afterwards, Dax said they weren't a welcome addition to the AEW tag team roster. He said they are the good guys in a world of bad guys. And, and he said they're scratching the surface of 5 and 10 and don't have the background JR likes to talk about. But they are the baddest. He called out various tag teams on the roster and said the top of their list are the Young Bucks. Obviously, he went through the Jurassic Express. He went through a variety of other teams, but he ended with the Young Bucks. He said they bit off a little bit more they can chew than, than they can chew. He said they're the best tag team on the planet. And the Butcher and the Blade, obviously, with FTR driving up in their pickup truck, Butcher and Blade were then seen in FTR's pickup truck. So Blade threatened to have Butch, uh, Butcher bash the truck with a baseball bat if they came any closer. Then they challenged them to an eight-man tag at Fighter Fest. FTR and the Young Bucks versus Butcher and Blade. And in the ring behind FTR was a returning Pentagon Jr. and Ray Phoenix. Pentagon and Phoenix approached FTR from behind. They got into a brawl. They packaged, pile drove, cash. Young Bucks made the save. And... I was getting my my wallet out, Jesse, at the thought of uh, the the Lucha Brothers and FDR in the ring together. Take my money, man. I mean, like again, all those fantasy matches that we that we envision for FTR before they came over, they're about to come to fruition. I mean, if if I mean, think about think about if you're the Bucks and Tony and Cody and everybody, and you get in, you think about when you were a kid and you get your favorite toys and you finally get to play with them. You just don't know what to play with first, you know. You just you just really excited, but you just gotta take your time and do it right. Because if you just play with it all at one time, you'll be done with it in the first yep. 10, 15 minutes. Or if you're so, Vince McMahon, you 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 take a new toy and you put uh, it on the shelf for about three years, and then uh, don't realize that you got it up there, and then you use it for about two weeks and then put it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Some of my, some of I just thought about though. Um, we were talking about them reforming the the horsemen and everything else and yeah. and now we're in the area of copyright has anyone filed for the copyright trademarks for the four horsemen uh that is a very good question i don't know that is a very good question sounds like something vince might already own and if he does sounds I like it i haven't heard anybody file for it lately if you know if it's not owned so that's interesting i don't know I don't know. Ric Flair's on TV. He might have to ask Rick about that one. And they've been using the four, you know, the four horse women over there. Uh, I wonder if Vince already owns the four horsemen, so maybe they can't necessarily do a four horseman over here. Well, listen, if Cody, if Cody is, uh, you know, hinting at something like this and has an idea about it, there's going to be a situation where nobody knows better than him. So I'm sure that's he true. knows if it's not copyrighted or not. I'm sure he's got his lawyers on it as we speak. Yeah, that's true. Video package aired on the best friends in Kenny Omega with Hangman. And they uh, were talking about the tag team match at Fighter Fest. Ross talked about how Omega and Paige were an odd couple. Uh, I like odd couples. I think they're great. This one in particular. Taz brought up how one drinks straight whiskey and the other drinks milk. Excalibur talked about being around for the genesis of the best friends. They played up how they like to hug. Trent said that they hug not to have fun, but because it makes them stronger. Ross said, sports is about momentum. Shivani said the best friends are red hot right now. Omega says they're going to take the best friends seriously. Omega said that he and Paige decided to become the best tag team on the planet. And they did it just like that. 
Page said he and Omega certainly aren't best friends. I wonder if that has any uh, any gas to the fire, I would say. But it might just be something that kind of plays into Page's character right now because fuck everybody else, just give me a bottle of whiskey. Page closed <laughs> yeah. with, we'll see you two weirdos at Fighter Fest. I'm looking forward to this because not too long ago we seen Trent and Omega have a 20-minute classic on Dynamite out of the Nightmare Factory. And if it's anything like what we've seen with those two one-on-one, this should be an excellent tag team match. It sure will be. I mean, I don't, I don't expect anything less than that. Uh, I think the outcome is also, again, predictable. Yep. I mean, but it's it's not going to stop it from being a great match. But So it's as, as long as they give us the match that we think that we're going to get, fine. Um, predictable ending notwithstanding, I'll enjoy it. Yep, same mm-hmm. here. And then we get uh, whatever build for the tag team titles happens. They may even yeah. lose the tag team titles before we get into All Out. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see they what happens. Those, but uh, that, that's the most preparated. exciting aspect of it. I think the predictability of it is is okay. You know, obviously the, the, right. the outcome should be in no question here. But the, the one thing I'm looking forward to is where we go with Omega and Paige after this is over. So I'm loving what they're doing with the tag team titles. I, I've loved this dynamic between Paige and Omega. And me waiting for the implosion hasn't happened yet. Will it happen? Where they go from here. A lot of questions to keep you interested. So, two thumbs up, Mr. Tony Khan. We got a video package airing about Moxley and Brian Cage. Moxley said he isn't sure what to make of Cage, but he doesn't seem to have a lot going on between his ears. Excalibur said Cage's physicality is impressive. Shivani talked about Taz calling off Cage, but Cage slamming Mox through the back window of a car. Anyway, he said Cage will be his own man. And maybe uncontrollable even with Taz by his side. Taz said Mox will be damaged goods by Fighter Fest, which leads us to Brian Cage versus Joe Cruz. Laughed at Jim Ross saying his name on, on commentary because he didn't even get a proper introduction. Let me at least get the kid's name out there. His family might be watching. Yeah. <laughs> which That's is awesome. fucking great. You gotta love Jim Ross's quick witted fucking comments, even at his age. It's fucking great. Yes. Taz it. joined uh, the commentary during this match, warned them that this match might not last long, which it didn't. We got Cage winning in two minutes, and that was it. Uh, they did mention that, uh, Excalibur did anyway, that Moxley came in contact with somebody with the CV-19 and his quarantining. Uh, I-, I love that they mentioned that because it's fucking real life. It's somebody's well-being and, and health that's on mm-hmm. the line here, more so than a goddamn fucking fictional championship. But WWE would never, they don't even wear masks in the PC. So I love this. And Excalibur brought it to light why Moxley wasn't there. He's not injured. He's not fucking uh, on vacation somewhere. He doesn't have a prior engagement. He's fucking quarantining himself. Good on AEW for bringing real life into it. Taz entered the ring. This is probably my favorite part of the show. Fucking phenomenal promo. I love Taz. I think he's great. Clearly the Paul Heyman of this situation for AEW. Entered the ring, called Moxley for the match at Fighter Fest. Moxley, where are you? He asked. Taz looked around, said Moxley is looking at them from his couch. Taz said Cage is the guy who puts his body through a windshield and is competing while Moxley is sitting at home with a bullshit excuse. He told Moxley's title reign is in great danger because Cage can hurt him more than he's been hurt. Can you stop the path of Cage? Taz then asked. Ross called it a very profound question, quite frankly. And Taz was just very upfront, blunt, frank with John Moxley. This was a great promo. Taz is making Brian Cage. Brian Cage was legit coming in, but, you know, I don't really call anything perfect anywhere in anything that I do or eat or listen to or watch. Taz and Brian Cage and the pairing, Jesse, of both of them is fucking perfect booking. I think they complement each other so well, and Taz is making Cage look better and better week by week. Yeah, that's a that's a money combo. I think they found a, 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 a nice combo with Cage and Taz the same way that uh, WWE did with MVP and Lashley. Yes, and I uh, hated uh, that, and I think MVP is yeah. probably uh, on a three-hour shit show, probably the one few bright spot on that show. Yeah, my daughter, my daughter came in here while I was watching um, Dynamite tonight, and she saw that promo, and she, I mean, her first time seeing these two together turned to me and said, 
that guy looks like Brock Lesnar, and that guy looks like he's talking for him like Paul Heyman does. Yep. That's what my 10-year-old daughter said who had never seen this act before. And you know what? Yeah. The fact that she said that, AEW gets a W in the win column. Yes. I mean, that's what they're going for, mm-hmm. and I think they, they knew. If, if, that's, if that's the style and the look they were going for, and we're getting the success that we're getting from these promos and the look from Cage... It's it was it's a home run on this pairing that they have right now. Absolutely. And that's gonna that's, that's, that's gonna take them straight to Moxley. Yep. Looking forward to that match. And Taz has been on fire since being back on TV in a managerial role on Dynamite. Brody Lee, he was with Colt Cabana, and they were backstage. He said, "There's more wins where that came from." To Colt Cabana, Colt said, "It felt good to win. Success feels good." Brody said. He said, life is full of losses, but what counts is how you react. You showed me the world tonight on Dynamite with your hand raised. Brody said they will face SCU next week. Colt seemed to be a little confused, but we're getting Colt and Mr. Brody Lee as a tag team right now in the Dark Order. So that should be fun next week on Dynamite. Then we got the best part of the show. No question, even better than Taz's promo with Brian Cage, we got Britt. Baker in her van, in her plexiglass. Jesse's blinking at me like I'm a fucking lunatic. Baker sent Shivani a note. It was a note to Big Swole. Baker said she might have been in a dumpster for nine hours, but Swole is still the biggest piece of trash. Swole showed up and talked at Baker through the plexiglass. Baker claimed it was soundproof. Swole climbed up the vehicle and dumped garbage all over Baker. So, uh, Baker. so Jesse, Big Swole dumped Monday Night Raw all over Britt Baker tonight. Baker held up her cocktail and talked to herself. Swole danced and celebrated while Baker was throwing a hissy fit inside her plexiglass. Thoughts on your role model? I think Big Swole looked awesome tonight. Fantastic. And you have nothing to say? This egregious behavior against Britt Baker? Look, I'm, I'm look, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, the the segments that she has been doing have have been entertaining. I'm not gonna say they've been cringe or horrible. They've been entertaining, but I'm trying to get, I'm, tr- I'm trying to not get over Brit exposed, and I'm starting to feel that way. I mean, Bro, it's better than seeing Natalia on TV. It, it, it is, but too much of one thing is never a good thing from anyone. <laughs> They they I they pour myself a drink over here. They yeah, you know what? Charlotte's out injured. She's got an injured With arm. With elective surgery, She's got by the way. Injured fucking arm. Okay. What? Arm. Her injured arm? Arm. arm. She got an injured arm. Oh she, man. Well, how can I put this lightly to everybody listening? Uh arm. elective surgery, folks. What rhymes with the word I'm looking for? Biddies, arm, Randy Biddies, arm. Nia Jax injured her arm. All right, and what are they doing? Are we gonna have Are we gonna have Charlotte on TV every week, giving us a progress on her arm injury, or is she gonna go away to the Rumble? Go away to the Rumble. What? So she wins the Rumble next year too? Yeah, it's not. Oh, She'll be back by SummerSlam. Triple Threat: Nia and Oscar, Charlotte, the Raw Women's Champion. Book it. Now, the way I'd do it, I'd have Sa- Sasha beat Asuka if they want to go a different route, if Charlotte's going to be out that long. Merge the divisions and claim one women's champion for them all between Bailey and Sasha, right? They deserve it. You, get, you guys watching us at home right now, you want to know how badly they overbooked and overproduced Charlotte Flair. You know how bad they shoved her? Ask JD, who is the biggest Charlotte mark that you knew one year ago from right now? Uh, this, you. This we had all kinds. Don't of make debates. fun of the queen. Don't talk about my queen. She, I mean, I had I, we were having debates about who was better, her or the racist over there in Impact. <laughs> no, but, I mean, it, we we did it. I mean, and I was defending her to the cows came home, but then they kept pushing her and pushing her and pushing. Her. I'm like, dude, I I can't defend this. I'm tired of seeing her, and I've enjoyed her work, but I, yeah, this is too much. I don't like her anymore now, and they've made they made it like that. It shouldn't be that way. She's really good at what she does. I'm just tired of seeing it. Oops. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. I don't know what else to say. This is not Charlotte Flair hour, so I apologize for uh, both of us ranting on uh, on Charlotte Flair. But, I mean, we're, we're talking about overexposure. Jesse thinks that sometimes overexposure with Britt Baker is a little bit too much. But they, 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 they clearly want to keep her in everybody's mindset. They want a nice pair of eyes on Britt Baker because she will be back by All Out and she will be the women's <laughs> champion of AEW. Look, her segments are, are somewhat entertaining. So with that being said, I don't see why not every other week, maybe every two weeks apart or something like that, she can film a vignette, a segment from home, giving us a ridiculous status on her injury update, everything else, and some trivial shit that we don't care about. And it could be funny, and you stick it in, and that'll work. But having her on TV every week, you know, sit there and rib commentary, no, it's, no man. It's getting old already. But... Listen, she's entertaining, and believe it or not, you know, she's not that, to me anyway, she's not that terrible. She's come a long way, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do because I love seeing, the one thing I love is the growth in somebody that we're watching week to week, and she's grown from day one to where we see her now. She's grown. That's, she's all, grown. that's all I could ask for. She's grown. And if she continues that, then thumbs up for Miss Baker. Quickly here, guys, Hardy and Santana, Matt Hardy, came out as Damascus Matt Hardy, broken Matt Hardy against Santana. Uh, Hardy wins in 12 minutes here. Ortiz distracted the referee. Santana landed a running slam. Hardy kicked out and then uh, leveraged down Santana's shoulders, and that was pretty much it. After the match, Santana and Ortiz double-teamed Hardy. Street sweeper connected on Hardy. Out came Private Party for the save, and clearly they're building towards that. For Fighter Fest. Now, this was supposed to be Sammy G, Sammy Guevara against Matt Hardy. And obviously, if you've been living in a cave somewhere all week, Sammy Guevara suspended without pay from AEW. He was on a podcast that I will not name because it's utter and complete garbage, that podcast he was on, four years ago. And he used the R word, which I will not reiterate here for the YouTube gods to strike me down. You guys know what it is. You're not dummies. He used the R word, a lewd act towards a woman, and this woman was Sasha Banks. Sammy G was training, or not training, it was it was at a WWE tryout, and he mentioned something about Sasha Banks in a very derogatory way. So clearly this was unearthed on social media, and social media blew up. They were calling for Sammy's balls. They were calling for his head. They were calling for the skin off his back. They called for his job. You name it, they would have burned this guy at the fucking stake if you asked them to. But I know Jesse and I went back and forth on this. My quick, quick, quick thoughts on this. Sammy is not what you think he is in that four-year clip, four-year-old clip. He's not. I, I don't think he is. We all say stupid shit. We've all said shit that we regret. And when I listened to it, Okay, first of all, never in my entire fucking life, I think my grandpa would fucking slap me upside the head a thousand fucking, to throw me off the roof while he was roofing. He, he would, if he heard me use that word in, in, in a way like Sammy did towards a woman, I think my grandpa would have had my fucking balls in his iced tea glass. I never in my entire life ever used that word in, in that way to talk to a woman, to describe what I feel about a woman sexually, what they look like, anything. I, I think it's derogatory. Even if you're actually having sex with your wife or your girlfriend and you've been together for three years and you still use that word, I think it's, it's still think it's fucking scummy. You know, in, in that, in that uh, bedroom talk type way. It's fucking disgusting. You shouldn't be using the word period. When I heard the word being thrown out by Sammy, I knew what he meant. That's what people don't understand, Jesse. First of all, context. Yes, it sounds terrible on the outside, but the context in this situation, I believe you and I talked about it, it, it is key. We know he, he meant that Sasha is hot. Sa Sa Sasha is sexy. She's a beautiful woman. Anybody with two fucking eyeballs realizes that. But he went about it in the wrong way. I don't condone what he did. I do think AEW did the right thing by suspending him. I do think AEW did the right thing by docking him pay. He's going to see counseling now. He'll be further evaluated at a later date when he's finished. He will be back on AEW television. People do change. I do believe he's not the same Sammy four years ago as he is now. And I don't think he should be fired over it. 
That's my thoughts on it. No, what I don't do you think? think so. He, I, I don't think he should be, nor he will he be fired. And I, I agree with everything you, you know just said. You know, it it's it's hard to comment on the Sammy situation because, like I like like I thought about this whole situation, every case should be viewed individually. All right, so I don't want to sit here and try to put Sammy's case in a bubble and generalize it as in regards to everything else that's going on around the community right now. So, but that being said, yes. I think it was horrible what he said and everything else. But uh, I'll be honest, I thought that since it happened so long ago, not so long ago, but since it happened before he was employed where he's currently employed, and since it's not something that no one knew about before, he said this on a public forum. Before you before you continue, the public forum that he was on antagonizes its guests. And the podcast that he was on they welcome that type of behavior. We don't know what Sam. I'm listen. I'm not defending what he said. Okay, for the I, fucking I didn't reasons even, out there. Didn't even know that. Even know that. That's important information. I didn't even know that. But go ahead. That's important. The information. podcast that he's on elicits that type of behavior. Mm -hmm. They welcome that type of behavior. So we don't know if Sammy went into that. You know acting like those guys or if he was just acting like a normal human being and he was kind of coerced and he wanted to fit into the element of that show and said oh, that things film. like that on that show to kind of fit in with what they were doing, what they were producing. Nobody talked about that, though. Yeah, he was catering to the listening audience that he had yes. at that current time. Yes. Yes. I could see that. And then I didn't even know that till right now. I mean, it, it doesn't make it okay, but I can also see... A young wrestler who's trying to get his name out there, who's trying to he's trying to make it, and he's trying to relate to it the audience he's currently talking to. So he's using the language and terminology of basically saying, Yeah, she's super hot. I mean, you wouldn't go on the show and say, I saw Sasha. I thought she was very attractive. No, he was like, Oh man, I saw her, man. I would just wanna and he used the kind of language that we would talk about if he was just me and JD in a room with no cameras or audio. And we would laugh it off and get it. I don't think by any means whatsoever that he tried to say that that's what he wanted to do next time he saw her or that's what he was encouraging anyone else to do if they saw her. It was literally a term to explain how much, how attractive he thought that she was and it came off in very piss poor taste. Now, now Mercedes, Sasha, came out on social media while all this, it literally, it literally blew up in a half an hour, and then Sasha came out with a statement. Now, the way she went about it, you know, and again, I don't want to come off like a fucking Sasha Banks stan here, but the way she went about it, and the way she constructed her thoughts to words on social media, there's a reason why she's the legit boss. It's not, it's not just a gimmick on SmackDown or on Raw. She went about it in a way where she had the she she knows the power she wields on social media. If this was anybody else, she would have sent everybody all four million of her followers on on Twitter uh, and another five million on Instagram. Sammy would have been fucking dead in the water if he had tens of millions of people coming at him from Sasha Banks' account alone. She, he's first of all he's lucky that none of the roster came out and defended her, which is another story in itself. But she went about it said that she spoke to Sammy, said that they discussed the real issues at hand, what he said was not right. She gave him advice, and she didn't outwardly say that she accepted his apology. I'm assuming that she did. I'm assuming she's a grown woman, and he, and he said what he said, and she knows that he didn't mean it in the context that it was. But she didn't outwardly say that she accepted his apology. But, Jesse, the way she went about it, is she deaded it right there instead of sending everybody to hate on this kid. And it shows you the true professional that Sasha Banks is. And I even commented, it's over. Stop talking about it on social media. My shit blew up because I commented, you don't have any room to mention anything here. Sasha this, Sasha that, Sammy should be fired. The only thing that Sammy should have did is apologize to Mercedes, apologize to Mikaze. That's it speak to you know each other one on one and that's it it's over 
It's in AEW. It's in Tony Khan's hands now. I That's agree. It. I agree. I mean, I, 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 I think I, I, I love Tony Khan's approach to this. I mean, to me, it seems like when when Jimmy Havoc gets out of his rehabilitation program, to me, it feels like he is not going to be invited back to the company. No. But that, that's just no. my take on it. No. But it, to me, it seems like when Sammy gets done with his punishment, he will be welcomed back with open arms into the AEW locker room. Yeah. But, but, but I still like the stance that he takes where people are not just accused of something and then the company fires them for it. I mean, everybody is human and people do terrible things, but everybody should get a fair shake. And just because someone can get a Twitter account and type an accusation, does that mean that someone should lose their career over? Absolutely. I, uh, I wish Sammy yeah. the best. Uh, he's a very big part of Dynamite. Uh, I, myself, Jesse as well, uh, hold no ill will towards Sammy. I think this, it, it, listen, oh. every case is severe in its own way, in its own right. Not condoning any of the behavior that came out on social media with all the allegations against everybody. Even Brock Lesnar had something today from, oh from, from Terry Runnels. <laughs> Brock Lesnar flashed his fucking beast incarnate at uh, Terry Runnels in 2004. Uh, Jesse mentioned this to me. Is there going to be <laughs> swift punishment on Brock Lesnar? Are they going to fire him like they fired Jack Gallagher? Fuck no. Oh, Fuck no. I'm, Terry Runnels. Jesus bro. fucking like she's never seen a fucking penis before, right? She said oh he did my not God. Ha- he he did not have the next big thing. Oh, is that what she said? No, yeah. She said that he had that he had a little beast. Oh my god. <laughs> it was a little pink beast, you know. <laughs> well, what whatever the case may be. This is the same situation where Randy Orton Randy Orton flo- uh, flaunted his fucking uh, his viper around uh, creative back in the day, right? Nothing's gonna happen to those types of guys. No. A- and and, and I'm not sitting here condoning any of this behavior. It's sick. It that it has no place in wrestling. You know, I did find that story to be a little humorous because it was just so out of left field. I'm like, what else is gonna happen? Where, where, where are no, all these no. indictments on Vince McMahon? Jesus Christ! Everybody, everybody forgot about the sexual uh, assault case that that was uh, a, a Vince McMahon was accused of in Florida long yeah time ago. I remember that. Yeah, so nobody's bringing that one up. But we're not gonna see Brock Lesnar and Jack Gallagher in the same unemployment line. Mm-mm. I mean, I mean, it's they. It, you, you can tell that there is a hierarchy in WWE as it pertains to your position on the card. And what I like here at AEW is you get someone who's at the mid to lower part of the card who was punished the same way that a mid to upper guy was punished in AEW. And I do like that. I like that. It doesn't matter where you are on the card, you get the same punishment. Absolutely. So we'll see uh, what happens and what breaks on social media, man. Um, so many more stories still coming out. Uh, obviously, you know the uh, the biggest of the accusers, uh, Joey Ryan and David Starr and all those guys. And even Marty Skrull had something today. Uh, Paige's Ooh. family also had something come out, uh, come out today, yes. which, was, which was nasty in its own right. I'll go over all this stuff. Uh, I have it all taken down in my notes uh, on Off the Script, so I don't want to waste any more of your time and Jesse's time talking about everything that everybody else is talking about on social media. Let's get back to the wrestling. Final segment of the night. Orange Cassidy made his way to the ring. Jericho uh, minus Sammy. Obviously, uh, Jericho's Judas playing on the PA. Sammy not singing it tonight, as always. Uh, Jericho asked, why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? Why did Bruce write another shitty Monday Night Raw? I wish I had the answer to that joke. I, I, I don't, unfortunately, for everybody. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? Jericho said. He repeated himself three times. Jericho said, the more you hear the joke, the more annoying and dumb you realize it is. The more I watch Raw, the, the, the more I realize it's terrible. So we're in the same boat here. So Jericho... Said that about the joke, he applies this to Cassidy. You're the chicken that crossed the road of professional wrestling. The more I see you in your act, the more annoying you become and it pisses me off, he said. He said when he first heard his name, he thought it was stupid. When he first saw his matches, he thought he was an embarrassment to the business. He said when AEW signed Cassidy, he called Tony Khan, he called the Bucks, Kenny, Cody, and asked, why did you sign this clown? And they replied, the fans love him. He said Brian Pillman told him, To get over in wrestling, you need to be something no one has ever seen. So he applauded Cassidy for finding a way to get over on his own. So, Jesse, when I I heard this, I'm like, 
just throw Orange Cassidy in front of Vince McMahon. Would he be Orange Cassidy or would would he be uh, uh, fucking Priestley Cassidy or some fucking uh, R Truth like character in WWE? Get over on your own. That's like Cardinal Sin number one in WWE. Yeah, that that stuff that stuff he said was probably a legit shoot too, man. I know. That's why I brought it up. I'm like, what what did you think when you heard that? You know, getting over on your own. That's frowned upon in most you places, not in AEW. You, you can't do that, man. I, 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 can, I can literally only think of one scenario where Vince wanted someone to try to go get over on their own, and that was the New Day. You know, from from all from all of the talks that they done, they were told, you know, come up with something and get yourself over, and then they did, and then that's when creative and Vince took what they came up with and ran with it. Yeah, yeah, the new yeah. day is a good story. Like, I I didn't I didn't I, I think everybody's in the same boat. I didn't think they were gonna survive fucking a month, and then all of no. a sudden we see them, uh, you know, transform into what we see them today, and it's just a great story. Orange Cassidy has something definitely that uh, I believe is going to be a a lasting thing. In, uh, in in pro wrestling. So I love that Jericho kind of, you know, just shot straight with everybody there, you know, that he got over his on, uh, on his own. Cassidy said, uh, you know, the lazy slacker that he is, he doesn't have what it takes to make it to the top. Fans relate to that. This is why they love him, blah, blah, blah. He said he better be the best Orange Cassidy he's ever been because if he does his bullshit kick-me-in-the-shin offense, I'll knock your teeth down your throat and beat you in 20 seconds. He said... He better reach down deep into those pockets and pull out a man-sized miracle. He said that's what he'll need to beat him. To the fighter fest, the Orange Cassidy phenomenon is over because he'll make sure he runs out of juice. And then Jericho laughed at his own joke. Of course he did. So Orange, uh, I, I got to ask you, Jesse, did you like the fact that he did not say anything here or were you expecting him and wanting him to say at least something on the microphone with Jericho Standing in his face, I'm glad they kept the gimmick of him not saying anything. I think they had Orange do literally everything I would have had him do in this segment. As soon as he got done talking, he went over there and kicked him in the fucking shins. Oh my god, I I, I couldn't I couldn't stop laughing. Now you know, now they gave it they gave it to you tonight. It's not going to happen at the at the match at Fighter Fest because I mean the, the, the spot that everybody was looking forward to and the spot that Jericho said you better not fucking do it. They did it, so they can't do it again. Otherwise, it's going to it's going to look stupid. I think he'll do it. I, I think he'll do it. They'll probably do it right before. If I, to, to be honest, I don't know who's going to win this, but if Jericho if they have Jericho go over. I can see Cassidy doing it at the very end as he's beaten down and can't go anymore. But right before he's about to get yeah, beaten, I can see he goes that too, and yeah. kick, kick him in the shin. Yep. <laughs> that would be so. They, 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 they're building this feud such to such perfection. Love yeah, it. this is this is awesome stuff. Orange stepped up and almost said something, but he set the microphone down and kicked Jericho in the shin slowly. Uh, Ross says he's being taunted. Is Jericho? Cassidy put his hands in his pockets. Jericho took off Cassidy's sunglasses and broke them right in front of them. Uh, Ross said uh, he better have a warranty on those Ray-Ban glasses. So I'm thinking to myself, Orange Cassidy's just going to call Ray-Ban. Bro, uh, I I need a new pair of glasses. Jericho broke them on national television live. I'm sure Ray-Ban would give him a sponsorship right then and there. There So they uh, brawled into the bleachers. Cassidy tackled Jericho, beat him up. Then they went into the bleachers where the friends and family and staff were, uh, and they brawled into the stands. They fought near the audience, which I was a little a little taken aback by with all the news coming out of WWE, and then you got AEW bringing these two guys over where the friends and family are, and it's like, don't mix the talent and the friends and family because of what's going on. WWE made a big mistake with that. But regardless, um, Jericho set up a move on the on the production area of where they were, And Orange escaped. Then he ran and speared Jericho, who was standing on a table. They were brawling, and they went into the barricade a little bit. A little banister there. Jericho had his jaw bounce off the barricade for a little bit. And then Jericho was standing on top of what looked to be a production crate. Orange Cassidy went up the stands, got a full head of steam, ran down, and Superman punched Jericho off the production crate into a table that was set up. TV monitors all... Falling over Jericho, and then at the end of the show, Orange Cassidy shown with his ear bleeding from what I don't know. Might have been the barricade spot early on in this thing. Ear bleeding, he puts his glasses on, and he gives his uh, lazy thumbs up. And like I told Jesse earlier in the show, that was his Becky Lynch moment right there. Not to the extent of Becky Lynch, 
nowhere near the Becky Lynch moment, but that is the I moment guess. that made Orange Cassidy a star right there. That, that, yeah, that's his moment. Yeah, that's, that's his, his moment, ver- yeah. That's his version of it, yeah. sure. Scaled down, but yeah, that's... That that's that's gonna be his that's gonna be the the, the pinnacle of his, of his of his TV career. I mean that's gonna be at, at the height of it right there, man. So. so I'm looking forward to that match. And quickly before we get out of here, we'll go over night one because night two we'll save for next week and give you the preview predictions quickly. Jesse, rapid fire here. TNT title: Jake Hager and Cody. I'm going with Cody. Cody. AEW tag team titles: Kenny Omega and Hangman Page versus the best friends, the Elite. Yep. AEW Women's Championship, Hikaru Shida versus Penelope Ford, Shida. Shida. Private Party versus Santana and Ortiz. I'm actually taking Private Party. Santana and Ortiz. MJF and Wardlow versus Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy. I think that's self-explanatory. We're going with uh, MJF and Wardlow, I'm sure. Yep. And that's night one, folks. Night two, we'll give preview predictions next week. It's shaping up like this. Archer versus Janela and Nyla Rose will be there. Lee and Cabana versus SCU, Jericho Cassidy, FTR on the Bucks versus Lucha Brothers, Butcher and Blade, and then Moxley versus Cage for the world title. That is shaping up to be a damn good night. So, Fighter Fest is too big for just one night, folks. <coughs> and I'm sure it ended up being better than WrestleMania in many ways, many, many ways. But, Jesse, that is it, man. Any parting words before we get the hell out of here? Wow, man. Yeah, I mean... You know, I, I kind of want to let everyone know. I mean, I want you guys to listen to all these news articles that are coming out about this hashtag moving going on, and don't jump, don't jump to judgment, don't jump to conclusion. Listen to the stories, listen to what they have to say. They're not all lying. They're not all telling the truth. Listen and make your own assessment after you've heard from the other side. I agree. Uh, as soon as it goes to Twitter, it's not the end-all, be-all. It's not the final judgment. Social media is not uh, the uh, the courts. The court system yep. plays a uh, huge role in this. And uh, when all information is gathered, then make the final judgment. Don't please, please don't base any accusations on fandom. Please. Yes. Now, some of these guys, most of these guys are probably fucking scumbags. But... I- they, they they deserve their 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 spotlight as well to tell their side of the story and and no story you know uh, deserves to be just simply one sided. That's all I'm, I'm gonna like say. you guys. I've I've had some names on these lists come up that are pretty high on my respect level and high on my my fandom level, and they're being accused. And I'm not sitting there saying that oh, it can't be true. I mean, in some instances, these people are coming out and admitting it. Yeah. So. I mean, and then, and then when, with the, and then some of the ones that are just simply deleting their Twitter accounts. I mean, but by that, by all account, then you're guilty if you're deleting your Twitter account. Really, I mean, it, it's disgusting. So, I, I got all this stuff gathered on off the script. I'll go over some of the more uh, heavier stories that have been uh, revealed this week, and we'll talk about it then. But I want to thank Jesse for joining me on the podcast. As always, we'll be back next week for Fighter Fest. Of course, should be a big week. Should be a fun week, exciting week. And uh, again, I'll be live on. NXT Thursday afternoon right here on the channel. But guys, follow me on social media, JD from NY206. Make sure you guys check out Audible, audibletrial.com slash off the script for your free 30 days. And check out the Monday Night Raw review. And most importantly, hit that subscribe button. If you enjoyed any takes, any of the banter back and forth here between Jesse and I, hit that subscribe button down below and turn on that bell for notifications. Guys, I'm going to wrap this up, watch NXT, and get ready for the live stream tomorrow. Until then, hit that thumbs up, and Jesse and I will see you next week on Dynamite right here on OTS. See you guys later. Later.